Action. When Orange is the New Black first began, it offered a fresh take on life behind bars. Chocolate and vanilla swirl. Introducing viewers to a cast of characters and issues. The Lord is speaking to me right now. Faith. Corrupt my air. Mental illness. I made my own couture. And transgender identity are all examined, often through the eyes of its main character, Piper. Look at you, Blondie. What'd you do? Aren't you not supposed to ask that question? That blonde hair, that privilege, all based on real life, Piper Kerman. When people first meet me, they do not necessarily leap to the conclusion ex-con. Who spent 13 months in jail for a crime she committed years earlier. I am part of a large segment of our criminal justice system. Nonviolent drug offender. While in prison, the real Piper was struck by the prevalence of race and class. By how many inmates, and women in particular, are put away for nonviolent crimes. She turned her experience into a best-selling memoir. 24-hour lockdown. And now spends much of her time on the outside advocating for prison reform. I sat down with Piper Kerman earlier in Toronto. Piper, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Wendy. So boy, what a whirlwind. The, the, the book, the series. Did you ever stop and go, oh my, oh my goodness, how'd I end up here? <laughs> <laughs> it has been a really... Uh... A really busy few years. You know, the book came out in 2010, and uh, I met Genji Cohan that year when I was on book tour in Los Angeles, actually. And uh, things moved actually very quickly then, and here we are getting ready for season three to be released. So it is really an interesting progression. So you, this sounds like such a cliche, you come from a nice family, you were going to a fancy college, and you ended up in jail. What surprised you the most about jail? We all have this idea of what it's like from movies and TV and so on. What, what surprised you the most? What I feared the most was violence. And of course, we have this idea of prisons and prisoners as, this, as incredibly violent places and filled with violent people. And that was not my experience. Um, I actually didn't witness or experience a single act of violence during the time that I was incarcerated. That is different than the show. Um, because I'm, they're women? Um, well, yes, on a lot of levels. Women are much less likely to be incarcerated for violent crimes, and they're less likely to use violence to get what they want while they're incarcerated. And that was certainly true in the time that I spent in prison. Um, that doesn't mean I didn't witness a lot of conflict, uh, a lot of fights. You know, prisons are crowded, and there's very little good there, and what good things there are, there are not enough of. So, you know, of course you get conflict. There was, though, a lot of sex, <laughs> uh, <laughs> judging by the series, anyway. Uh, for me, it was a long celibate year. <laughs> but obviously, that's not true for everybody who's incarcerated. You know, um, humans are humans, and they are sexual, and that's true even if you put them in a cage. Um, so it's really interesting for me to watch, you know, the incredible array of female protagonists that Genji Cohan has created. And included in that, you know, array of people are, you know, a whole range of sexual preference and sexual activity. And I think that's great. I think that women's sexuality is important and absolutely worthy of sort of depiction and inquiry. So I think that's one of the greatest things about the show. In the series, your character is in solitary confinement. Well, it seems to be an issue for you. Solitary confinement is an issue for all prisoners. Um, the evidence shows that more than 10 days in solitary confinement begins to have an incredibly negative effect on your mental and your emotional and your physical well-being if you're a healthy person. And the people who we tend to put in solitary confinement are very likely to be mentally ill because mentally ill prisoners have a very difficult time following the rules of a prison or a jail. And too often, sort of the, spi the sanctions spiral and they end up locked up in solitary confinement, which of course makes them even worse. There's a very famous case here in Canada of Ashley Smith, a young woman with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. She spent more than a thousand days in solitary. She strangled herself. The guards didn't intervene. They'd seen actions like that previously. And uh, afterwards, the coroner suggested that the federal government put limits on solitary confinement. And they haven't. So they obviously still think, like many American officials think, that it works mm -hmm. or is necessary. 
Ashley's death is uh, shocking and so tragic. And the lack of response to that in terms of making better policies is also shocking and tragic. Actually, in the United States, there's an increasing consensus that we have far too many people in solitary confinement and that that is actually harmful to public safety. You make a particular plea about the number of women in prison. Mm. The numbers in the States and in Canada of women uh, incarcerated is, is, is increasing. Mm -hmm. For decades in the United States, uh, women have been the fastest growing segment of the prison population, and the percentage increase in women in prison is 650%, which is staggering, and you might draw the conclusion that there's an incredible female crime wave happening, right? But we know that that's not actually true. You also seem to suggest that the system is a bit corrupt, or at least massively unfair. <laughs> Well, in the U.S., um, what we see is the biggest determinant of who will end up in prison is uh, not necessarily who is most likely or, or who is inclined to commit a crime, but race and class are really the big determinants. So I often say that the most unusual thing about my story is not that I committed a crime, because middle class people commit crimes, women commit crimes. Uh, rather, it's the fact that I was policed and prosecuted and punished with prison because too often, particularly in the United States, the question of who is pursued by law enforcement and who is punished by law enforcement is very much determined by race and class. And so we might find two young men committing the exact same crime at the exact same time. And if one of them lives in a dorm room or a fraternity house, and one of them lives in public housing, it's very unlikely that they will be treated the same way by law enforcement. Because they're racist? Because of their class. But because law enforcement is racist? Because or? law enforcement is deployed really uh, and directed towards poor communities and disproportionately towards communities of color. Um, and that is part of the directive that they receive but, you know, I think we're fooling ourselves if we imagine that middle class people never commit crimes or that they're equally likely to be policed. So has this experience, has it changed you fundamentally? Has it changed your life? For me, uh, the women who I met in prison changed my life in dramatic ways. They helped me survive. They shared their own survival with me. Um, and the friendships that I, that I keep from those days you are very precious. Oh yeah, there's many people who are depicted in the book who I'm still in touch with. And those are really important friendships to me. Um, I think the most important thing that I draw from the experience is simply that the American criminal justice system is really a crucible of inequality. If you want to understand American inequality, all you have to do is look to our criminal courts. And so that is something worth talking about and worth fixing. Well, it's been a real pleasure to oh, meet you. Oh, nice talking with you, Wendy. Thank Thanks, you so Wendy. much.